well. There is a way to read. There are some books, there is nothing like I've read it before. I hope you know that there are books like that. There is nothing like I've read it before. Sometimes every six months or every one year or every two years or three years, you go back to it. I was discussing with some of my pastors and I told them the encounter I had. I've always been a teacher. I know that um, many people will not believe this. They will believe otherwise because of the move of prayer that God has committed to us. It is a stewardship. But according to my training, both from the village and from the campus, I was trained as a teacher. In fact, it is by the word of the Lord that I obeyed and entered into this prayer thing. And if time will allow us, I will show us the reason why you have to obey God in such a way, even if it doesn't really tally with your kind of person. This prayer thing doesn't tally with my kind of person. But over time, I found out that that's, that was my natural person. It is not necessarily whom God has ordained and proposed that I am in him. So many of the things you think you cannot, I'm this kind of person, I'm this kind of person, those judgments are from the natural. Over time, you will find out that in your pursuit of God, based on his instruction, certain parts of you that was not obvious to you and to people, we begin to be made manifest. If you're with me so far, say amen. Amen. So I was telling them that I've always been a teacher from the village to school to many places, but some years ago, not too long ago, maybe about seven to eight years ago, I don't know if it's about that, I happened to stumble upon a man's material. And I said to myself, if I have seen this material all my life, because I used, you remember what I said, I used to boast too. I came back with youth service, as people are carrying back things, I came back with very big ganamos, very big jumbo size. What filled it is books. I think our Alawi was 18,000. I spent 10,000 every month buying books. <laughs> That's how. And I know that there are many people that have done such things like that. Instead of eating, they, buy, they motivate us. Use that money you are about to use to eat and use it and buy books. If I had known, I would use it and eat. <laughs> now, there is no knowledge that is wasted, but it is not necessarily relevant to where you are going. You're just stressing yourself. It is better to know more deeper information concerning where you are going than to gather, so, some of the time, when God really starts taking you on the path, you will have to unlearn before you learn. And that's a problem. Unlearning is more difficult than learning. And I hope you know that information forms a... The reason why information has the ability to drive your life is because it has formed a high place in your mind. And that is why the scripture said, that all those high places have to be cast down. It takes a lot to cast down a high place that has been built by information. Are you seeing it now? Example, if, you are, if, if somebody is a Muslim, there is really nothing too spiritual. Well, there are a few spiritual things about what they do. But what they do is primarily an indoctrination. Information repeated, 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 repeated until it becomes what? A stronghold. A high place. A stronghold. Now, imagine when you now realize your calling by an encounter. And then you have to unlearn. You will work hard. If the person is not committed, many times he will give up along the way. Just imagine you. 10 years, 15 years after being in ministry. I've met pastors, I asked them, they say they have been in ministry for long. You have been in ministry in the wrong, not exactly in your own calling. Are you seeing it? 
And the information you have gathered to support your calling is not on the exact thing that you need. Now that you have found out what you need and found out materials that can feed you, I hope you don't want to sleep. Hey, hey, God. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you sleep, what will happen to congregation? Huh? They will slumber. But pastors sleep anyway. We know ourselves, so I can. They sleep. Hey! They sleep. One pastor was nodding head like this. I thought he was following what I was saying. <laughs> but he has slept. Amen. Amen. So please pay attention. That's part of the sacrifice of being a leader. Is it not true? It's basic. We know these things. You become a leader by, by being a leader, by being ahead. Amen. Amen. The greatest challenge we will have, we have now and will keep having for men of God is adjusting to the knowledge, to the information that is now needed for you now. Do you know what you have told yourself? Some of the time you read other things and think that you have actually changed. You have not. This is you for long. There are certain encounters that are forever cut off from you until you unlearn. There are certain things you can't change. It's, it's a wine skin now. Are you getting what I'm saying? Uh, Your wine skin can't carry. If you, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. First level. It's not to get anything, to do anything. First level is take time and unlearn certain things. Are you getting what I'm saying? You don't know how much you have been affected by what is not necessary. You don't know. And if you take a new wine and pour it into an an old wine skin. What will happen to the wine? The bottle, well, the bottle will break and the wine will waste. So everything and anything that is poured into something or someone that still persists in the information that needs to be unlearned so that you can carry out new assignment for God is wasted. That's exactly how I wish we can project. But I know somebody can read it for me. That's exactly what was happening with Peter in the book of Acts chapter 10. Man of God. Please come and sit. Or if you are comfortable there, you can sit. You people, come and sit. Come and sit. Come and sit. They can sit here or here. Where would they sit now? Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. Somebody help me and read Acts 10. Where Peter said, not so, Lord. Verse 14. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything. Wait, let's get a mic for you. Just start from maybe one or two verses before then so that we can have context. Okay, verse 12. Wherein were all manner of four footed beasts of the earth. Okay, start a verse before. You are a pastor, so you should know. Yes, sir. Where, so, uh -huh. Verse 11. Okay. And saw heaven open. Okay. And, okay, from 10, sorry. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell so into a So, what was trance. happening is that God was using a circumstantial thing to teach him a deep spiritual truth. Mm. What was happening looks as if it's just a normal thing. But. The difference between one, one method of God's oppression and another is being captured in that moment. It looks as if it's just a normal circumstance. But the difference between the two directions of the level of God is being determined. What looks as if it's a normal circumstance is God choosing actually the verses through which he will accomplish his purposes as of that moment. Please read. Verse 11. And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, and as it had been a great sheet, neat at the four corners. Okay. 
and led down to the earth. Okay. Verse 12. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. Okay. 13. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Okay. 14. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or Just unclean. imagine. I hope you know you have done such. My brother. Many times. Many times. Do you know how many things God sanctified that you called unholy? Meanwhile, with your calling it unholy, you are still expecting God to move. He's telling you this is this is where I then this is how I ordained it. Yeah, bro. So continue. Okay. Verse 16. 15, and the voice came, spake unto him again the second time. What God has cleansed, that cannot, that call not uncommon. Okay. 16, this was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. That means the stronghold in the mind of Peter was so strong that God argued with him how many times? Three times. And he kept saying, not so, Lord. You don't know the power of strongholds. You don't know what you have become because of the information you fed yourself. A lot of people meet me and they said, man of God, it's, it's five years ago I could have followed this thing you are doing. But you use two years to fight it, use one year to doubt, use one year to believe, and use one year to follow. You are already behind. Do you know how fast the move of God is? If you sleep for one month, you will be overtaken. In one year, I, I know what I'm saying. I, I'm not privileged to speak about things in a certain way, but I can tell you something. If God is moving you sleep for one year, you will just see yourself back. The people you are working with will seem as if they did. Boom! Why? It is not them moving. Now they can tell you strategy, teaching, Maybe when Apostle Femi comes, he will teach you that one. But I'm teaching you from the realm of the spirit. Something carries people. Oh. Something carries people. I will never, if I don't teach you this, that's the greatest strategy of a man of God. Something needs to carry you that cannot be explained. So if we come to pastor session and explain everything, if it is that easy, everybody should have it. There is a lot of things that cannot be explained that is happening. That means something is carrying somebody that is not written in a book. Several pastors have missed strategic seasons and kairoses of their life, and they are stuck. I hope you know that sacrifice is powerful. Huh? But not as powerful as obedience. In fact... Sacrifice is powerful on the day of obedience. The day you start obeying. So if God told you, do this, and two things happen. One, you didn't do it, or you waited, waited, waited. I hope you know that obeying God has a ripple effect. For example, you are a man of God. God can tell somebody to come and sow seed to you. You need to sort out something in your life. Your children, you told them, watch, you told them, I'm going to pay your school fees tomorrow. Now, your children came and told you about school fees. Who has need now? You are correct. Now, but the children can't get that money. You are the one that can get it. So God now met somebody that needs a promotion in his workplace, but cannot get it done except by a spiritual, a prophetic push. Are you getting the point? To come, God told the person, go to this man of God and sow this seed. So the man of God receiving the seed pays the children's school fees. The children receiving the school fees pays to the school that they are going to. Are you getting the point? The school being a Christian school pays tight to their church. The church receiving the tithe were able to host their annual program. 
So as they are praying, Lord, give us form for our annual program. The first thing is for that first man to what? Obey. And they are fasting, and God told them, in two days, I will do it. Are you seeing it? Now, God come and met you and say, do this. I hope you know that the second point in obeying is obeying promptly. Because if you don't obey, God has already said two days. So if God called you to do something in your territory and you kept delaying, kept delaying, kept delaying, there is a time frame for certain kind of labors in a certain kind of place over some life and destinies. There are some people you need to do some things over. I might travel out and they have, are you getting what I'm saying? Yes, you keep delaying and then what God will do is to take that thing that he told you to do and give to another person. Even if you are better than the person. And that's the problem with pastors. They now look back and say, ah, this person that I'm better than. Do you know when I started ministry? Do you know this one? Do you know that one? I know one thing. You know what I know? You are disobedient. And we can stand here and analyze the reason why somebody can be disobedient. And in the case of Peter, and which is the case of many men of God, the greatest reason is sentiment. But that's for another day. Sentiment. <laughs> sentiment. I remember when God told me to come to this Newe and start. I tried to go everywhere for six years. Nothing happened. Part of my challenge is that my own biological father is also doing ministry in this town and he's alive. How can, how, do, how does he sound now? You are still doing ministry in the same place, even though it's not the same kind of ministry anyway. But, in fact, what people said is that me and my father, we are enemies. That's why I now, I now broke out and I'm doing my own ministry. My father that I, I'm so easy to me. And I'm, it's just that I'm not the kind of person that I, I, don't, I avoid anything that looks like psychophancy and all that. So, and I don't like doing things so that I will prove points. So, many things. And even people canceled me and said, no, you cannot. But when I go back in the secret, God will tell me, if you don't do this within this time, you will miss it. There is a time frame to obedience. If you miss that time, brother, you will struggle. You will struggle in ministry as if God did not come. If you see a man that missed his time, he's struggling as if God did not call him. So much struggle, so much labor, yielding nothing, yielding little. What grace can do, your own human effort is now the one powering it. Are you getting the point? What grace is meant to do? See, they come and sit here now. Come. No be cheated again. Come now. Make space for Chidi. Let him sit. He's a man of God. Ah, the two of you is wearing to match you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The stronghold that Peter has built did not allow him to obey God. Please, you can sit there. That's just the whole point I'm trying to make. He kept saying, not so, Lord. Not so, Lord. Not so, Lord. Not so, Lord. God is telling you something. You are telling him, not so, Lord. Who are you? Even if you will die, obey him, die. It's your fear that is your problem. Die. Of course, you will die. You might not die physically. But you will die to your opinion, die to human opinion, die to what people will say, die to what you will suffer. You are going to suffer. Now, even if you teach, 
even if you are a new creation reality teacher, a pastor, even if you are teaching the people the same thing so that their life will get better, you as a pastor suffers. So we, even, if, even, if you don't believe, even if the audience doesn't believe this message, it is dangerous for a pastor not to believe that there is suffering in the calling. It's very dangerous. Very dangerous. Legitimate suffering, not the one that Satan brought. Oh. <laughs> of course, I'm not talking about the one Satan brought. I'm saying suffering, labor. If it's those days we are in the video, you carry megaphone on the head. I don't know he's a big man, but in the beginning, you know, Marek? <laughs> Join and carry speaker. An average pastor is a technician, an usher. Uh, yes, am I correct? Yes, you will do many things for long until somebody will take it from you. Somebody said, until God gives him a whore, a sound, shares, and people. God, God didn't call him, if you ask me. You said he's not ready. Me, I said God didn't call him. God call you. The urgency of the call will not even allow you to sleep. You will not bother whether rain is beating you. Ha. Church or how many genuine ministries started in a hall? You started in people's parlor under trees. People's parlors under trees. Classrooms. Classroom is even good. Store. Ah, you have money to pay for store. <laughs> you have money to pay for store. You already have money now. Field, open field like this. The only thing you have is word and prayer and God's conviction. People will believe you. You look back how you started, some of us, you wonder what people believed and followed you. If it is not that God called, say after me, I will stay steadfast to the core. I will stay steadfast to the core. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Over time, it will be easing out. Over time, it will be easing out. Is it not true? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. so, so at different rates. Different rates, dependent on the kind of calling, on the kind of principle you, you practice. A few things that will affect it, which is not my level now. So I said that there are three levels of knowledge. The first one is information. And for information to come, you have to first of all unlearn before you what? Learn. Then the second level of information is revelation. Say after me, revelation. Now, the reason why I went through this route is... The reason why I went through this route is because most of what will be taught here is on the third part, that is wisdom. There is information, there is revelation. The third one is wisdom. First level is what? Information. Second level, revelation. Third level, wisdom. Now, majority of what will be taught here, because Apostle Femi will take over now, will be what is wisdom. Wisdom is simply a strategy that brings solution to challenges. Are you seeing it? It's like a strategy table. By the time, if wisdom is properly cooked, bro, are you coming late to my class? Oh God, be careful. Hey. Tomorrow I will lock my door very early. Once the man of God enters with locked door, it's common sense. Now, when wisdom, this vegetable matures, you have what we call systems, power things. But there is a reason why I'm, I will have to touch a little on relation. I wrote something on my note here. I said, first of all, number one, information is, is like it's like um, the general 
awareness and information that is available to anybody. But for that to be practical to you, for that to apply to you personally, you need revelation. If a man of God comes here and, and teaches you seven things, even if you work for him, even if he works for everybody, it will not necessarily work for you. You have to remember that the call to ministry is not a physical thing. It's not business world per se. Even though some of the principles there will work, some things still hinge is spiritual appropriateness. So you have to consider this. And it is on this basis that you have to have the revelation that the man had before he gave you the information. That's what I'm saying. So if you don't have the revelation that a man had before he gave you the information and go ahead and build a system, there are several things that can happen. And if it's in the move of God, the Holy Spirit will live. Systems without revelation will box the move of God. Are you seeing it now? So that's the major thing I want. That's what I wrote on my notes. So you, you really need to have the revelation. You cannot just be practicing things without having the revelation that the person that handed that information had. That's why you have to be spiritual in this class. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's simple but profound. I wrote here, don't be in a hurry to systematize until you have profound revelation. System without revelations will keep the move of God or it will not even allow it to emerge at all. Amen. I don't... I know I have other things to say, but it's not my duty now. Can we have a mic? I want us to work. The volume, okay. Just add. Let us welcome my poster to the microphone. Amen. Good morning, sirs. Always a joy to be here. Always a joy. I honor all ministers. Um, men and women here, and God's servant here, Pastor Tony, good to see you again, sir. God bless you so much. Please help me celebrate yourselves um, in the most profound way you can. Amen. Please be seated. God bless you. Um, let me say this as we start, all right? Um, I've taken time to pray ahead of this meeting. As In fact, I thought it's going to be where two or three are gathered. But I think God needed to give me a heads up, so he showed me a vision of what the class will look like. So, I mean, I'm, I'm so amazed to see what God is doing. And this is my core area of calling. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that I am here. All right? And the things Apostle was saying when I came in, were, they are very profound. There are things that if you don't get on time, it may take a lifetime to learn. But let me start with a word of encouragement. Paul told Timothy, he said, let no man despise your youth. Anything that is still young has the tendency for people to look down on it. Okay? Um, but the future of every forest is in the seed that is sown. So nobody will value your calling if you don't value it. Is that okay now? I know you honor men, you love people, you honor people, you see what God is doing, you respect it. But never honor anyone to the degree that you lose, you lose your own calling. Never get to, never honor people that you import their uniqueness and lose your uniqueness. Is that okay now? So Father, we ask for insight this morning and revelation knowledge that your minister will see what you need everyone to see. I didn't hear amen to that. Amen. That you will not just hear the word, you will be able to handle it. 
in the name of Jesus. And I, I decree grace upon ministries in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So let's do a bit of Bible study. Okay? Are you with me? Let's do a bit of Bible study. Let's pick a few things from what Paul said. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. I mean, um, 1 Corinthians 3. So let's, um, let's start the reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians 3 from verse 10. Seeing what Paul said, says... Um, are you there? According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builded thereon. But let every man take it how he build thereon. And um, so Paul um, describes ministry. He, he used many um, metaphors to describe ministry. But here he describes ministry as a building which makes the minister a builder. Is that simple enough? Uh -huh. Okay, so he said, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Okay? Um, another builder there on, but let every man take it. How we what? Builds. So it means a minister of God is first and foremost a what? But you know, if, we, if Paul was saying this in our generation, saying I'm a wise master builder, you probably will call Paul proud. Who is it to say he's a wise master builder? Only God can say that. Well, you're either a wise builder or a foolish builder. There's nothing in between. And he was saying what he, what he was. He said, I'm a wise master builder. That is, I'm not building by guesswork. I'm not building by luck. I'm not building by circumstances. I am building something with a picture in mind. Now, look at it. Look at where Paul was talking from. Um, 1 Timothy chapter number 3. All right, let's start reading from verse 1. I think I'm going specifically to verse 4, but let's start from verse 1. Look at it. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good, a good work. Yes. A bishop must be what? Blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. I'm going to come back to this apt to teach. It doesn't matter what dimension of calling you have. You can't teach. You are not in ministry. Okay? You don't excuse ignorance with miracles. You don't excuse ignorance with tongues. You don't excuse ignorance with prophecy. You teach. A minister must be able to teach. All right? Not giving to wine, not, no striker, um, not greedy or filthy looker, um, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Yes, verse 4 now. One that the ruler while his own house, having his friends object with, with all gravity. Yes, continue. Quickly, quickly. We don't have time. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Yes. Quickly. Not a novice. This is verse 6. Not a what? Not a what? Uh -huh. So, um... I'm not sure that for the past how many years now, maybe just at home, if somebody, um, I'm, I'm, I can't remember the last time I picked any book on anatomy, physiology, hematology, med, medical virology to pick anything to read. I can't remember the last time I did that. But there are things you can't take from me. It doesn't matter how many years I hold the mic. You can't take them from me. Because you've been trained. They've been wired into you. You spent night and day studying into them. They can't take them from you. It took years to get degrees on campus. It can't take you a vision to be an apostle. It can't take you a dream to be a prophet. It can't take you just one intuition to say you're a pastor. People are trained for this. Beyond the revelation, get the training. If not, you minister shame. Is that okay now? Uh -huh. uh, how do you get somebody to build you a house? And they say, this is my first attempt. 
And um, <laughs> are you with me? You know, things are happening in this life. And the person is asking, uh, which one again is the... Which <laughs> you know, you are not building a house, you are building a coffin. God will not entrust things to your hands and people to your hands more than the capacity you have built. He will not. Capacity is built for ministry. In fact, look at the way Paul also describes it in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 1. Quickly. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I, I love the... Um, look at the way Paul describes it. He said, I therefore the prison of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are what? Called. You walk worthy. Now go back to that verse. Can you give me an amplified? Do you have other translations? If you do have amplified, I'd appreciate it. There are people who are doing ministry who don't know anything about ministry. How can somebody be in ministry for 10 years and can't describe ministry? Can't define ministry? One of my boys met a guy. Look at it. I therefore, the prisoner for the Lord, appeal to you and beg you to walk, lead a life worthy of the divine calling, which you have been called with behavior that is a credit to the summons of God, to the summons to God's service. He used the word vocation to describe ministry. Not as a way to reduce ministry, but to tell you that ministry is work. Okay? One of my... Ah, God, should I even... Okay, let me just share a few things. One of my boys met somebody who came to meet him. I'm, I'm sure you must have met people like this at some point in your life or ministry. Or in case if you are somebody like this, this God's divine opportunity for you to know that you are doing something wrong. And the man has been, the man came to meet him, was striking, looking tattered. And the man said to him, he said, the, the God has given him a vision to move from cities to cities um, to pray for nations. And the man said he's been doing that since 1996. All right? Um, the idea of that thing is that can God call a man to do that? Yes. But there's no structure, no pattern. He resigned from his job and just moved from one place to other. Before you know, you move from being an intercessor to being a sudden prophet, from that to adding begging to the skills of ministry. Because anything that has no structure has no future. The structure that bears witness to the fact that future will come to what you are doing. When God speaks, don't run. Ask how to do it. Ask how it is done. Speed in the wrong direction is not speed. Ask. Is that okay now? Pause and what? Ask. How is this done? How can I go about this? It's a vocation. It's a vocation. And there's a need for a lot of learning. It's a vocation. Tell your neighbor, ministry is a vocation. Yeah. Um, by the way, as a way of making sure we ensure balance, the qualification for ministry is mercy. You did not do anything to hand the call of God. He entrusted it to your hands. So you must always reach out to find mercy, to fulfill it. 2 Corinthians 4 from verse 1. 7 Corinthians 4, 1, seeing therefore we have this ministry, all right? Go back to King James, please. See, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we have received what? Mercy. We do what? Faint not. But we have renounced the hidden things of what? Dishonesty, not working in craftiness, or handling God's word deceitfully. But by the mention of truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So the, what qualified you for this work is what? Mercy. How that not many wise were called, not many nobles were called. God used the foolish things of this world to confound the what? Wise. So, let's reach our hands and say, Father, thank you for mercy. Amen. Now, put your hands down. One thing, I'm, I'm going to stay on one thing today. Let me stay on one thing. 
I know I have early morning flight tomorrow, so I don't know <laughs> the possibility. That's around five. Must be quite early. <laughs> okay. So, um, if ministry is described as a building by Paul, it means we have to pay attention to what David said in Psalms 11.3. Give us Psalms 11.3. I'm giving scriptures because um, to, um, sometimes pastors, we can have the assumption that people understand without scriptures. Can we read this together? One, two, three, go. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's a very strong question. Okay? So if ministry is a building, it doesn't matter what your intentions are and how much you have to build. If you get the foundation wrong, you'll stop at some point. How do I help you now? If you intend to build a 40-story building, hmm? 40. But the foundation you have laid can only carry a bungalow. Any attempt to go beyond the bungalow is digging your own grave. So it means that if you intend to go far, pay attention to foundation now. Your foundation can arrest your zeal and it doesn't matter how powerful it is, you have to stop. So while this may look like a general statement, let me help narrow down to what foundation um, really is that you have to get right in ministry. Is that okay? Are you still with me? All right. When Paul was speaking about his calling, he, he said something that is so profound. He said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So, um, your calling or the knowledge of your calling can come in different ways. It could be God can show you a vision. It could be with a knowing in your heart, an impression. God, you can't box God to a corner as touching how he must speak. He chooses to speak the way he wants to. He's king. In fact, he's not just king. He's the king of kings. Is that okay now? So, um, ministry doesn't start with impressions. It starts with visions. And that vision doesn't mean that you are necessarily going to see one angel descend from heaven and then say, uh, what do you say they used to call it? Kine do popu. <laughs> you see you, see, you suffer my hands. <laughs> I will not forget. That's one thing. I, I'll go back and replay the video and hear it again. So when next I'm invited, I say, I want to invite Pastor. I, I post with Chinedu Poku. <laughs> and this one is one Chinedu Poku. <laughs> Am I getting it right? <laughs> oh, God help me. It is not whether your own vision was in 3D, HD, or 5D that determines whether you do well in ministry. You can see 50 billion angels and still fail. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? You can see the heavens steer into two and Jesus himself coming and pour keg of palm oil on your head and still fail. It can't help you beyond the degree to which you take yourself serious. He sent a message to Eli. He said, tell Eli. He said, I have chosen before that you and your father have to be priests before me forever. He said, but now I have changed my mind. He said, far be it from me. He said, because they that honor me, I will honor. They that despise me, I will lightly what? Esteem. That's what he said. He said, I will lightly esteem them. He said, you know. If you don't take yourself serious, nothing will take you serious. So you must understand. You must fight for it. <clears throat> Is somebody following what I'm saying? Ah. So, um, however, one of the letters of Paul, he said, say to Archippus that see to it that you fulfill the ministry that has been committed to your hands. Um, listen, though. Vision, as far as ministry is concerned, is not necessarily what you saw in your dream. Vision is... The vision of your ministry is the purpose for which the ministry has been set out. The purpose for which the ministry has been what? 
set out. Why Your vision is what explains the reason why God is calling you. And let me also give you this because there's a common mistake. If you are an associate pastor, you, don't, you can't have a vision. The vision of the house is your vision. Our vision in our ministry is to go and raise God's end time. We also use the word vision for the word mandate. Okay? So this is one of our pastors. He pastors Port Harcourt Church. That vision is his vision. It is already error. Uh, can I teach? Uh, if you are serving under a ministry with a vision, and then you have another vision, it's called division. Only monsters have to add. You submit yourself to the vision of the house. And it is not being number one or number two. that may, See, you are either pursuing God's calling or pursuing success. Are you with me? When God calls you, if God says submit under a ministry, that is your what? Calling. If your esteem is not intact, you will give yourself a calling where there is no calling. Please be seated. I was pastoring in the redeemed Christian church of God. And I did that for some years. And I was more than sufficient. In fact, I insisted myself that one of the biggest sacrifices I've had to make is to leave the redeemed Christian church of God. So there was never a time that there was any ambition that would have a church. In fact, I used to tell our ministry that our people that if we ever become a church, leave. That's to tell you how much I didn't want to become. I don't envy pastors. I don't envy general overseers. Having 1,000 branches. Do you know what that means? Jesus had 12. Judas was there. So imagine 1,000 pastors. Do the maths. Are you following what I'm saying here? However, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So you must understand. You have to get it right. Ah. Um, okay, let me push. Listen to this. The moment you get the mandate wrong, everything you will do, as far as that ministry is concerned, will be wrong. Everything. Everything you will do will be wrong. And I'll tell you why. The vision of the ministry God is giving to you is the purpose statement of the ministry. That if the purpose is wrong, you will abuse it. That's the reason why God is called. And I, I hear people, see, listen to what I'm saying. While you are seated here, if you are around the ministry, if you know that the vision is not clear, I'm not saying you should go and stop the ministry. I'm saying you should pause. Don't, don't use arrogance to push a life that there's no future. See, so I tell you, what's the vision of your ministry? What's the, what's the mandate of ministry? It's not clear. They say, God has said, I should. Number one, your mandate can't be general. It's specific. God has said, I should go and raise um, Christians everywhere. Who are doing where? With the way the person is talking, you know he doesn't know what he's saying. It doesn't mean he doesn't have a calling. But he is not patient to hear. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes, Don't listen to what I'm When you stand before people who know these things, humble yourself. Don't use your energy to say, hey, but I know what God said. You don't know. So I hear people say, my mandate is to, my, and, and then you discover that there's no finger of God in it. Because God will not back up what he didn't call. He won't. So my mandate is to go and raise believers everywhere who are happy and doing life well. My mandate is to go and raise Christians everywhere who are, who are doing well on different mountains. Which, which mountains? Kilimanjaro specific 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 are you with me first you know you have a calling before you know what the calling is and understand that purpose becomes clearer with time and exposure so if you ask me what my understanding of going to raise end time is, is 10 years ago and what my understanding of it is now, the, dif the distance or the difference is clear. Because as you mature, it becomes clearer. Don't think all you know is all there is. This thing becomes clearer with time. Is that okay now? So you must, you must be clear. So vision is what lays the foundation for the ministry. 
I like to sit down whenever I'm teaching ministers. Can I sit? That's, that's my culture. That's my cultural way of talking to ministers. Hope it's acceptable. Okay, all right. That's, in fact, that's when I flow the best. Okay, you can put it there. Thank you. Can you still see me? Are you sure? Okay. All right. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Um, let me say this. Your vision is what your ministry has been called out to do. Your mission is what describes how it will be achieved. Ha, ha, ha. If you know what you are to do, but you don't know how you are to do it, you still struggle. Now, let me say this to you. 99.99% of ministries are victims of where they are living from. Let me explain. It matters where your foundation ministerially was laid because you are most likely going to be an extension of that foundation. But the mistake people make most times is that they import the vision of their former places. For instance, if I, without knowing where a pastor is coming from, if I meet a pastor who lives, who, is, who was pastoring a redeemer and is now pastoring, and I say, what's the future of the ministry? You will always hear to make heaven. I mean, uh, have I lost you? You can be so much in love with where you are living that you import it here. And sometimes you also import the error. It is possible you are, you are leaving a place to start a walk. And God will have to first detoxify you from where you are living. Don't envy what God is trying to change a man from. What you so much love in this man is what God is trying to discipline the man from. Don't envy it. People grow. So even if you follow people, not if, even when you follow people, follow their updated version. Let me tell you. Anybody who will do ministry now must understand this generation. Are you sleeping, sir? All right. Don't worry. Look at me. At least that wakes everybody up. Are you there? Or am I shouting? Okay. You know, Gen Z now say, you shout, you shout. Um, you know, there was a time in ministry, maybe somebody else. Um, Let me tell you, I want to put it in a very simple way. The generation our fathers pastored is not the generation we are pastoring. The generation our fathers pastored love God. This one, would they force them? That generation, if you discipline them in church, they will go back and pray, serve punishment, sweep. This one, you meet yourself on Twitter. You just notice that you are trending. <laughs> are you following what I'm saying? The generation of our father's pastor is a generation of faith. In fact, ministry or a Christian work is solely based on faith. The generation that have not seen yet believes. But the generation that we are pastoring now needs their questions answered. Don't tell me faith. Tell me what is this plus this and that. They have questions. So it means that the people who pastor this generation must be more informed. I was somewhere where somebody was asking a pastor's wife question about the difference between spirit, soul, and body. No, spirit and soul. If right now you, you are struggling to know the difference, just write it down so you go and learn it. Don't use bold face to cover ignorance. Is that okay? Good. And the pastor's my wife was explaining and said, have you seen the movie Jumong? Say this, this, this. You look at the person asking the questions, you, you know that this fellow is discouraged. 
Because you can be in the seat of power and you are a novice. That's why many churches, they don't ask questions. These things are things of the spirit. You, have, you, see, you see, it's not for Canada people. As you mature, you understand. Pastor, you don't know him. You don't know it. You either know it or you know it. Is Jesus God? Looks like a simple question. When you get to him, are they the same person? Is Jesus God? Looks, you, you, you need, are you with me? You need to know the doctrine of the Godhead. Your pastor, you've not taken any training on, on systematic theology, bibliology, and genealogy, um, um, soteriology. Uh, you, you, you don't know all those things. You just say, no, no, no. We go push them. You don't go push anything. <laughs> we train for these things. We train. The Bible as a science of interpretation. Huh? We call it biblical hermeneutics. It has a science. Preparing salmon, homiletics, as a science. It is learned the way a doctor will go to class and learn how to incise, how to, huh? The angles of incision of veins, how to give injections. You, you will have to learn. Muscles teach. You have to learn. You learn your way around the Bible. So that you will not face shame. And when I say you will not face shame, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show yourself approved. A workman that needs not to be what? Ashamed. Rightly dividing the world. This generation that people are saying, are we live? Huh? We are live. Okay, all right. So I, mean, I don't go shout. Because now people are saying they have 20 powers. They have all those things. You say, nah, lie, nah, lie. You, can you use the... Uh, No worry. Let me not shout. <laughs> it is not enough to know that what you are saying is wrong if I don't know the scripture that backs what I'm saying. There are doctrines that look true until it gets to certain junctions. You must be a man who knows your way around scriptures. The way a leader studies is different from the way an average member studies. Because you know that your, doc your doctrinal perspective is building lives. So it must be accurate. Accurate. We strive for accuracy. Now, I spoke about vision, I spoke about mission. The tool for fulfilling the vision of your ministry is your message. Is your what? Your message. Let me show you a scripture. Act of the Apostles, chapter number 6. Are you there? All right, I mean, popular event that happened in the early days in the early church. So in those days when a number of the disciples were multiplied, there are those murmurings among the Grecians, all right, and against the Hebrews, all right, so it which was a murmuring between the Grecian Jews and the Hebrew Jews, that is, those who are more enlightened and those who are just coming up. All right? Because their widows were neglected in daily ministration. Quickly. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples and said unto them, It is not the reason that we should leave the world and serve tables. Yes? So wherefore, brethren, look you out amongst you seven men of honest report, full of... You see, if you are a, if you are a leader of leaders, that you, have, you are a minister who has ministers under you, verse 3, is, you need to pay attention to it. You don't put people in position based on charisma. It's based on character. There are charismatic rebels. Hmm. 
I think, was it yesterday you said it, or I came back to the hotel to hear it? Somebody preaching. It doesn't matter how loud your message is. Your life is louder. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. And let me give you a warning. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Anything you want to see in the ministry, model it. What did I say? Model, model it. I called a young man to see me years back. This guy was sleeping around with girls. And as the head of a ministry, a girl came to report him and said, hey, my servant and this pastor have been sleeping with each other. And it doesn't look like it is stopping. So I said, tell him I want to see him. So I invited him to my house. So I was asking him questions. So I noticed that while I was asking him questions, he sat on my swinging chair and was just rotating his leg. I was just... Yeah. <laughs> so I said, you are sleeping with... Her. He said... You know, God has forgiven. He said, uh, so, um, it's just one of those things. And, uh, I was shocked. Until he mentioned that it's just one person. He said, ah, no, two. <laughs> so, yeah, I said, well, he said, he said, um, he said, spiritual father has four. The father has modeled the kind of sons you want to raise. Listen to what I'm saying. The same message you are preaching to justify what is wrong in your life is the same message that is raising those who copy you. Let me give you an instance. If you are a rebel that breaks camps, once God puts you under a father, you go after the next reigning father, after the next reigning father. The message you are using to justify that lifestyle is the same message that is raising those that will leave you. It's not true. The same one. So you must understand that the message you preach is the tool that God will use to actualize the what? The vision. We call it the principle of the man, the mandate, um, the man, the mission, and the mandate. Um, so sorry, the man, the mandate, and the message. The same message. Once your vision is wrong, how can you say that you have call to raise end time mammies, but every message you preach doesn't look in that direction? People don't know these things. That your message, you, you can't preach every subject in the Bible. Your vision becomes the lens through which your message flows. In fact, in ministry, we have not, we have not been called to preach everything. Mm. One of the disciplines you must embrace to fulfill your vision is the discipline of repetition. You see, are you with me? A minister that will build well must learn to say one thing in many ways till it sinks in. It is it, the, the one thing we are saying, they've not gotten it. And one of the ways you know they've not gotten it is that when you say it in another way, they are saying, mm. <laughs> And you are like, is this the same thing I'm saying? Listen, when David said, the Lord is my shepherd, he said, I shall not want. All right? Look at it. He makes it to feed on what? Green what? Pasture. Not new pastures. Green. It is fresh, not new. <sighs> what we strive for is freshness, it's freshness. The, you know what freshness means? Where it is coming from. When people cannot keep the secret place, that's when they try to bamboozle people with new things. And you know something? New things edify souls, not spirit. If I, somebody was preaching and he said, there's, there's a difference between the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit said, talk me, talk to me, pastor. 
He said the Holy Ghost is called Holy Ghost because he operates at night. The Holy Spirit is called because he operates at Hey, whoa. That's not a revel. That's a refuse. Mm. The hunger and the desire to say new things will put you in trouble. There's nothing you want to say that has not been said. In fact, one of the ways you know you are, you are, you are already heading towards destruction is that the angel who told you about your calling told you that your kind has never existed before. Say God had to enter into the oven to make. Say you you are the beginning of a new order. <laughs> Pride goes before every fall. Pride goes before every fall. I'm just giving you the basics. Tomorrow I'm going to show you how to build ministries that are transgenerational. And these ministries that will outlive you. Hmm. It doesn't look like you are ready for that. Are you? All right. I know this is supposed to close by eight, so I'm, I'm winding up now. So I've spoken about your, your vision, your mission, and your what? Message. You must get them right. Let me give you two more. All right? That you must get right. Listen to what I'm saying. The vision of the ministry is what determines the kind of program of the, the ministry organizes. What's the vision of this ministry? You remember what? The mandate. Now, for maturity. Pay attention to what he say. Are you, if you're maturing people, that's when you do 50 days of Pentecost. I know. Yes. If he says God is saying to mature the saint and to do all those things, and then he's organizing talent on. We know that he's not serious. You say, you say, what do you got? You say, ah. You say, that there are some programs you probably won't see me do. If we do it, it will be at the level of our local church pastors. Maybe they are ecumenical in nature. Are you with me? You won't see me come and say, I want to have um, music concerts. I'm not a musician. I give our pastors liberty at the branch level to have special meetings. We will vet it. We can have worship meetings. But my mandate is to go and raise end time armies. When I see people, what I see is discipleship. That's what I see. <laughs> That's why I teach and teach and teach and teach and teach and teach. I have over 2,500 messages unreleased. Back to back. When our school of ministry started, I taught for how many hours now? Stop. No, of course, breaking weekend within the space of three months. You think it should be about, eh? Eh? Uh, three months. 16 hours per weekend. 664. That's 16 hours. Per weekend. Do the math now. Four, um, four weekends in a month. That's how much? I mean, do the math. Huh? 64. Right? Times three. Huh? No, that math is not correct. 16 hours. Six hours, six hours, 12 plus four, 16. 192 hours. Hey, that thing you are called to do, you must know how to do it well. You must know how to do it well. You can't know how to do everything but teach. What spirit is that? That's the truth. Hey, your mission is what determines the kind of programs you organize. Many don't know that. You can't just say, I have an impression. No, no, no. Is it in line with the vision? Every program must fulfill the vision of the ministry. Every. Are you with me? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. 
Are you sleeping? No. Okay, all right. You are awake now. Lastly, um, let me. Can somebody help me with this bottle of oil? If you look at this oil, um, okay, this won't do. Can I have a bottle of water? Any bottle, whether they've drank or they've not drank, any bottle. Okay, thank you. All right, look at this. Water, this water is shapeless, doesn't have shape and all that. Okay, it takes the shape of the container. If you pour this into another container, it takes shape of that container. True? If you freeze it and you tear the container, the water remains the shape. That is the way your structure is to your calling. Your structure is what gives shape to the calling. Sometimes the calling is correct, but the structure is wrong. And the structure defeats the calling. Let me give you five important things to note about structure. Number one, they are not built in a hurry. Number two, the one you start with is wrong. Ah, you don't know that. You started at the level of the knowledge you had. As you mature, they must change. The structure revival orb is functioning with now. It's not the structure you started with. There are things you've upgraded, changed. There are things you see and you ask yourself, hey, who did I do this? For example, we started with giving a lot of uh, in financial aspect, we gave a lot of financial autonomy because of um, you know we were doing it in good faith. Mm. Yeah. But we, I noticed over some time that they, they don't have as much discretion as me yeah. in managing those funds. Yes. So we have to rein in a, a few a little bit of, of structures, structures around it. You see that now? Structures change as you mature. Hmm. Let me say this to you. No matter how much in the hurry you are, hmm? You must know when your, when your ministry is not ready for what you want to do. You might have a friend that they now have a branch in Portacourt, have a branch in Umaya, have a branch in this, and you feel, hey, it's time to start branching. And now you are making babies to raise babies. <laughs> Branches are not ready until the men are ready. Ministry does not start in places, it starts in men. Very important. There are places that people are saying, hey, Apostle, we can't wait for you to come. Now, trap. <laughs> Until we have strong men there. Uh, we receive call. Apostle, come to Paris. Uh, we can only come there to organize a meeting and leave. No, churches are not ready. Until pastors are ready. When we're going to start our UK church, we have, I mean, across, we have people, people across. You know the way UK is structured. But we started in a place, not that it's closest to the people, but closest to our pastor. If the head is correct, the crowd will gather. You must get leadership structure right. Ah. If you don't want to weep at the end of your days, it matters who your leaders are. And ask people questions. How long do you intend to follow me? Don't do assumption. Ask. Nowadays, loyalty means little or nothing to people. Ask. And, are you with me? In order for you not to be stranded, the culture of raising men must never stop. In fact, the way the body is not stranded is that when a cell dies, another place tells every place. Mm. when cells are damaged and they keep multiplying that's what you call cancer for you not to have a cancerous system you must have a system that keeps raising men the proof of your apostleship is your epistles and your epistles are in men 
the quality of your men determines, shows us the quality of your work. And sometimes I see cases, somebody just get to a place. No, 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 it's the assistant get over here. Because he preached well. People who have no depth. Abraham armed his trained men. He didn't train his armed men. It is training first. You don't give people tied to only to start looking for a way to train them. No. Training. Sit on. Are you following what I'm saying here? Yes, sir. When they said, look, Acts, Acts 6, 3, that I showed you at the time. Men who are honest, of honest people, but full of the Holy Ghost. It's not charisma. It's not the person's ability to preach. The devil was charismatic. When I see pastors who don't labor on training, I know they are work on less. Even the people the pastor raised, see the pastor as a joke. See him as a joke. No honor. There's so much familiarity. Familiarity is only a problem for a ministry that there's stagnancy in grace. Familiarity is because people have caught up with you. You are not growing. Let me end it. Hmm? Get this structure right. Get financial structure right. Don't use your personal account for church. That's the way stealing starts. You say, we want to show a city of ministry. Can we get the ministry account? Say, ah, we are seeing the name there. And the name we are seeing here is um, John something, something. You're wondering, what's this nonsense? Let me tell you, ministry is both an organism and an organization. As an organism, the bread of Christ. As an organization, it needs stru functional structure to survive. You must get the boat right. You will have leader who, leaders who understand ministry as an organism. Their own is prayer, prayer, prayer. But you must also have those who understand ministry as an organization. Their own is less put structure. I know my team is correct and complete when they argue around the table. If everybody says yes, something is wrong. When they argue, it means that they are seen from different what? perspectives. Are you following what I'm saying here? God strengthens you. Um, this looks like a class already. We we'll continue from here tomorrow. God bless you. Thank you so much. Wow, this is powerful. Let's celebrate our apostle again. Amen. I think this is a sign to us. What do you think, Chidemo? We will start having very strong and pungent ministers' conference, pastors' conference. We will start having. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, my brother, is the one that moved me. He just chatted me and posted some challenges and all that. that that I asked him, bro, how far did he mean? He said he's moving well, but feedback, things are coming. That, So I told him one of the things we do is to profile challenges. Huh? That's good. We will be doing more, especially within this region. Some, of, some, some good stuff are not that available. And then the kind of environment, because I hope you know, the altar you hear things from affect you too. Some of this information, you might have heard it before, but it's making impact on you now. It's because also of where you are hearing it from. Are you getting the point? I know that. Where you are hearing something from matters. Matters. Uh, there are some things you doubt, and I do doubt because of who is saying it and where it's being said. I'll just look at the person and say, ah, this person. Uh -huh. In our post, you just said, that um, people that pray, pray, no organization. I have to say something about that prayer thing. <laughs> you know why? Let me tell you why. Prayer can be organized into a regimen. Let me tell you how prayer can be part of the structure. Before we start any program, let me tell you how we got the team for this conference. God spoke to me. I did not tell them what God told me. I took a portion of the... Is it not true? 
I took a portion of the scripture, gave up to all of them, there are many, and said, pray and tell me, it's up to how many verses in total? Who can help me remember? Where is Chimo? How many? El Who is answering me? No, you can't answer me. I'm talking to my pastor. Uh, huh? 28 verses. So I now ask them, tell me the most three striking verses in this place. Is that not what I did? By the time we are through, the, team, the verse of the theme of this conference was the most chosen verse. Of course, you can't come to that conclusion. So, you see it now. If it's in, in um, settings like Scripture Union, before they come to guest minister, all those ones, they ask us, even when I did NCCF, I don't know who did NCCF, they will ask us to go and pray so that we'll find out who will be the leaders. Go and pray. Let's find out what will be the team, the quarter team. Is that not how it's done? How many of you did NCCF? How did they do your own? Is that how they did your own? You are part of the, if they didn't pray, it's your fault. So you pray. You see, prayer in this context has become part of the structure. It's a structural thing. The reason why it's also important is that you will not orga don't organize a way prayer, God. <laughs> if you organize a way prayer, you're on your own. When you finish, you find out that some people have, you have all they have. You know all they know. You are not having the result they are having. Your eye will open. <laughs> uh, yes. I don't know about you. My best ideas and vision come after I've prayed for long. And that is why if you, if you normally relate with me, you know I respond to chats around 4 a.m. 3, 4 a.m., 3, 4 a.m. That's when I finish praying. And it, anything I do that time is correct. Anything. Once I pray into the wisdom of God, pray into the mind of God, I start organizing things. That's how. That's how I stumble. Somebody came and asked me, how do you get the team for bed punks? And that's how I get there. You pray into the mind of God. Do you know what the Bible said? Jesus prayed all night. In the morning, he chose the apostles. If you like, don't just wake up and choose something and kill yourself. <laughs> My friend, and if you have not prayed well, don't... Let me tell you something. Some of you should not even be putting structure at all. Go and pray first. Go and pray. Some of you, I said this someplace, some people are saying, you are rushing into your calling too fast. You have not prayed out. There is something that needs to crack. The wisdom of your calling is beyond you yet. You have not entered it. You think, you think the wisdom of a man's calling is learned in a, a book another man wrote. You are the one that will find it. You pray into you, you charge into it. Do you know how callings emerge? Do you know how visions emerge? In fact, you can be... Oh, Sorry, I just charged now. Listen, there are things embedded in your spirit that you don't... You have read some, but you don't know how to put it in context in your own calling. When you pray, 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 God will not tell you, oh, yeah, do this one like this. Do the, put this person here. Say, can, can this person do it? If you have not faced that situation, you will not. You are, can this person do it? Can this person? The voice will just tell you, put this person here. <sighs> put the person. Only to find out that it's a master stroke. Master stroke. How do you get there? So, as Apostle is bringing the church as a building. I'm, I'm bringing the church as a body. <laughs> as an organism. As a body. My God. And of course, there are systems in the body. Am I correct? Yes, so organism is not averse to systems. How many systems do we, you are a medical, how many systems do we have in the body? 
Oh, guy, you are a doctor. Answer me before I deal with huh? Oh, guy, come and take mic and finish. Tell me how many systems. Where is Dr. Ifan? All the time you are adding Dr. Ifan to your name. It's time to defend your name now. How many systems do we have in the body? <laughs> My God. Hey! So, and all that. We have many systems in the body, and still the body is an organism. So, we will have more past, and I will trust God to be able to bring a lot of facilitators, strong people over time. Over time. It has been in my mind, but I'm saying, is it time? Let's push it to five years. But it seems as if we are here already. What you don't know, you don't know. You can't kill yourself. You don't know it. Leave it. You don't know it. That's, where, why, that's why you are where you are. Somebody came and said that apostle is lucky. No, you don't know things. You don't know things I know. It's simple. If you know, you don't know it the way I knew it. If you knew it, you are not using it, practicing it the way I'm practicing it. It's obvious. Humility, meekness is the first thing you need to learn. Amen. Tomorrow morning we are coming back again. I just, at some point, I felt we should continue and deal with this matter. Ask some questions and sort of some things out. But I'm not sure you people will survive my pastor's conference because you're going to fast. There is nothing, if you come, the one I saw in division years ago, I saw where I locked people. They are crying, they want to leave. I locked it, kept the key. <laughs> you are free to enter. You are correct. I will not release you till that three days. That's how to do it. Sometimes you need somebody that can. You want it, but you have not been able to discipline yourself into it. You need somebody to discipline you, or at least hold you accountable. Even if it's not by force, but at least somebody is. Holding you accountable to it. There is no time. Oh. How many of you, you think you are 24 and you are young? You are old. You are old. And that's the problem with Africa. You, before, if you see somebody saw me and say, this young man, very small and young, God is using you. I say, do you know how old I am? I'm old. So it's in Africa that you are 45, 50. The, you are the president of youth department. You are youth pastor at 50. Come out of that place, you are old, my friend. Your destiny has finished. They have rounded up for you. They are welcoming you back to heaven. <laughs> there are some things God cannot assign to you, and I can tell you free of charge. It will take a, a very high sacrifice to start doing, redoing some things from 40 years. The people that are here that are up to 40 know it's costing them a lot. It's costing you. It's costing you. Costing you humility. Costing you a lot of stuff. I know that. So I want to start early like Chidi. I know that. Father, I pray for all the pastors. I ask you, beyond their imagination, cause their vision to come to pass in the name of Jesus. Yeah. I ask for an activation of the angel of your calling. Moses said it clearly. He said, you are telling me to go. You have not told me who you sent. Who you sent with me. Strike for me in one minute. Strike for me. You are telling me to go. You have not told me who you are sending with me. It was there that God said, I'm sending that mighty angel. His name is Michael. The prince. Some of you are carrying a very strong calling, but the angelic backup is weak. I see the Lord activating the angel of your calling. Some of you are going back with one, two angels, three angels from this meeting. There are angels that follow men that are stewards, that are custodians. These angels have walked with men long ago, but they have died. 
and are looking for men like you to walk with you again. You have not shown me who you have sent with me. You have not shown me who are you sending with me in this season of my calling and ministry. In Jesus mighty name. Pastors, may the hand of the Lord come on your life. May your ministries be transformed. May the sweet influences of the Holy Spirit come upon your ministry. May there be more to tell about your ministry than what you are doing. Let people experience more than you are explaining to them. Let their life change beyond your plannings, beyond your programs. Let things happen to people as you do your ministry that will change their life forever. I pray that the Lord will give you a transformational ministry. Give you the grace to pick people from one point and take them to another point. I pray that the Lord will give you the grace, the grace, the grace. Grace is all. Grace is everything. Grace is the most important thing. Grace. 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 Receive grace. Receive grace. Receive grace. Let your amen be louder. Receive grace. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. So let's find our way to the main camp because we have already started pushing.